we don't have to worry about being perfect on this earth. We just got to keep seeking Him and press toward the goal for the prize. And there is a prize, and it's the Lord. That's a prize. Believe me, I look forward to heaven. Heaven's not only a destination I look forward to. Hey, young people, heaven right now for me is a motivation. It's a motivation. Check your motivations. What motivates you for life? Thanks for joining us back on the Victor Marks podcast with Victor Marks, founder of All Things Possible Ministries. Welcome to the show where we bring you real conversations facing life's hard truths, stories of redemption, and the latest from the front lines. As we close out 2019, we invite you to celebrate the great work that's been done with us this year. If All Things Possible Ministry has blessed you in any way, or you'd like to help see Victor and Eileen continue their work, feel free to visit victormarks.com to see the many ways your giving can impact their efforts to restore those affected by trauma around the globe and help thousands of women, children, and members of our military find hope, healing, and the power of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, whether you're on the road, getting your day started, or finally settling in, we've got an exciting new episode planned for you. So let's dive into today's show. In this week's Continued Life series, Victor shares the redemption that gave witness in his distress and stories of God's saving grace that shows us it's not just about striving, but abiding in Christ and pointing people to Him. He uses us miraculously through His grace. Here is Victor Marks with part two of Hope for Your Jacked Up Life. (laughs) I've always tried to take the worst and make it work for me. Like at school, people be like, I'll whoop you, man. My dad will whoop your dad. I was like, your dad won't whoop my dad. I'll kill your dad. (laughs) Read the newspaper clippings. And uh, (laughs) and all this kind of craziness. I mean, I started drugs in the sixth grade. I understand it. I understand self-medicating. The problem is it doesn't work long term. Does that make sense? I mean, I, that, that, I'm not, I don't judge people for addictions, uh, whether it's drug use or porn or whatever or however, fighting violence. I don't judge them. I just want to show them there's a better way. Because anybody who gets addicted, they know they're in bondage at the end. They go, this, this ain't working for me no more. I'm locked up in my own soul and life. Whether they're Christian or not, they get to that place to where this ain't fun no more. And I simply go, I know, man, I feel you. Because that's what the Bible says. There's a way that seems right to a man. But in the end, it's death. And you're not going to change the word of God. It was here before you. It will be here after you. It is eternal truth. You either let it help you. Or you will continue to complicate your life. I call it by pulling the pin on your own grenade. I was in the United States Marine Corps. Let me tell you what. To hold a fried grenade and pull that pin and then release it and hear it go click. 1,001, 1,002. Do you know what that has to do with this message? Nothing. But I will tell you, it's such a good feeling just to pull the pin and throw a grenade. (laughs) I'm just saying, it's a rush. It is pure adrenaline. (laughs) Okay, <laughs> sorry, this is how I am. Okay, um, so I went to this school, I shared, and when I told these kids about my story and how my, uh, one of my grandfathers died in a mental hospital, and I know about mental illness because of PTSD is affecting me, post-traumatic stress disorder because of trauma that affected me as a kid, it still affects me today, but at a lesser degree, say amen. And thank you, Lord. I'm more high-functioning than I was at one point in my life, right? Because the grace of God and good counseling, I'm like, hallelujah. But I still get affected deeply. There are times where, man, there are times where my distress and sufferings are so great. I, I go, Lord, really? <laughs> and he goes, ah, yeah. But my grace is sufficient. Okay, I know, but can... <laughs> I know the grace thing, but I mean, can you just make me perfect now? If you really want it. 
I got to get you to heaven, but if that's what you want. Okay, well, wait a minute. Let me, not just yet. When I tell these kids my story, how the doctors, the psychiatrists looked at me and said, you know, your mind will never fully function because of what you've been through. And I look back and go, well, it never fully functioned anyway. <laughs> and I didn't need a $200,000 college bill to tell me that, buddy. Keep paying on your note. Now, one of my grandfathers that died in the mental hospital I never met, but my other one killed his wife in public because she cheated on him. A sexual issue. She cheated on her husband. So he shot her in public and then killed himself. I believe in purity. I believe in striving for it by the grace of God. I'm not perfect. I struggle with things, but I'm going to tell you what. When I look at those kids, 2,000 of them sitting there in Lake Elsinore and said, because of my background and because I've never given up and I have a secret to all this, I have never, I stand before you all today, married 25 years to one woman. I've never cheated, never been cheated on, and I got five children ages 27 to 3. And you know what? Those kids, just like y'all, <laughs> high school, public school kids were clapping. Even though they're going to be knocking boots after a party. Lit up. Because they know, even in their heart, I get that applause from kids in the L.A. correctional system, which is the largest in the world, juvenile kids, 33,000 kids processed a year. I get the same applause from MS-13 gang Gang members. Because even their heart knows, dog, got to be something better than what I'm trying. It's called hope. And the God of the Bible is the God of all hope. Real hope. Well, that school I spoke at, and this was a deal I made with them. I said, we told the administration, look. There's a film on my life story. It is my testimony. We're not trying to hide anything. It's my secret of how I got out of an impossible situation. And I got a book and I said, look, let us put a table in the back of that gym of my films. And when I'm done speaking, we will give the kids the free opportunity to walk by and grab a copy for free. It's on them. We're not mixing religion and state and all that. And they said, go ahead. But they're like, you know. Kids are not going to really want the spiritual resource. I said, okay. So we did it just like we did every other place. And guess what? 2,000 kids in there, over 1,500 copies of my film were taken that day. And they're, look, they're, I get bombed on Facebook, Instagram. We get emails. People saying, dang, touch my life. I, I, I get them every day. I don't care. And they hear the gospel. They hear the hope. Does that make sense? It's, it's a good tool we use. But I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what. I did go back to that school two weeks later for the little Bible club. Because they, you know, those 23 kids typically that go to the Bible club. And I told them, I'll come back after I speak. So they sent out some flyers. We had a bunch of people praying. Guess how many kids showed up? Over 400 to the Bible club for lunch. And the guy, the guy, they just kept coming in. They moved us into a gym. They kept coming in. And he was like, we're not going to get everybody in here before lunch is over. You, you're not going to have time to talk. So we're like, okay, just stand against the wall. The things are, uh, he goes, all right, you got 18 minutes. Tell them about Jesus. And I did. Boom, 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 boom. Got to carry a Bible. Ah, Bible. <laughs> no one died. It was amazing. Priest Jesus a hundred and twenty something kids gave their life to Christ during lunch. That's so you see, it's pointing people to Jesus, it's keeping our eyes on him, it's not trying to do for God or be, it's just abiding in that makes a difference. Because I mean, I even I struggled these last couple of weeks, I was like, Lord, I shouldn't I don't want to even go preach or talk or speak at Tustin. I love that church, I love Barry Pastor Barry. I said, you know, man, I've gone through so much because I've had a hard year. The year's been hard. God's been doing amazing things, but it's hard. Isn't that funny how it works sometimes like that? It's like, uh, suffering and then fruit. It started out in December when uh, I had an emergency surgery. Don't y'all love those? <laughs> when the doctor tells you, you're going to have to have surgery. I'm all, okay. 
Let me pull out my calendar. Because we schedule me, buddy, for everything. Check through my speaking guy. He goes, no, there's a surgeon coming. You're going to be on the table in an hour. Okay, so what's this about? He says, it's your appendix. And it's going to bust if we don't get you in there. It's like, I'll hold my breath. <laughs> Actually, I was excited to get the surgery because I was in. I was home, which is rare for me. You know, I could have been out on the road somewhere traveling, right? And had to get in the back of a van, veterinarian van or something, you know, just <laughs> chicken next to me. Just cut it, doc. Go ahead. So I was excited. They did the surgery. It was all good. And then I developed issues on my neck. That is a hoot. You get compression on a nerve. Everybody ought to try that once in their life. Holy smokes. Three of my discs got compressed, a nerve atrophy set in. I couldn't lift up my left arm with a cup of coffee. And I'm a pretty prideful macho guy. I was like, oh, and those nights of pain where nothing helps. I don't care if you got drugs and all that. It's still not helping. Crawled in a little fetal position. You can't, you can't even talk. And then the next level of pain is where you can't even think. And it's like the devil comes in then. Bing, bing, bing. Boom, 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 boom. So what you have is prayer. You call out to God and he hears us. He hears us. And uh, he never forsook me. But boy, what a tough deal. I mean, just this week, I got six shots in my neck under x-ray. And the doctor, he's, I'm like, don't miss. <laughs> All I got to say, <laughs> oh, that was very embarrassing because, you know, they give you that little la-la juice. And I told him, I said, I don't, I like to be in control of my stuff. I said, so just give me half. Okay, I can take some pain. And I said, uh, well, give me half. But they, they mixed up that concoction or whatever. And I, when I came out in recovery, part of it is amnesia stuff they give you so you don't remember. Uh, I was embarrassed as I'm talking to the nurse, telling her the amazing, beautiful experience of 25 years of intimacy with your wife and honoring God and how it works that way. She's like, that's a, oh, that's a blessing. That's all I remember. My wife is driving me home laughing her head off. Going, well, honey, I'm sure they hear all kind of stuff. Like men's infidelity. At least you're bragging on the Lord. I'm like, I don't want to go back again. I don't know how God uses us, but he does. And uh, my dad, you'll see, he's in the film. And uh, it was unexpected death. But he died, and uh, he's still dead. Uh, 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 and that was hard. And that's still hard because I miss him. He, he wasn't. He was the drug dealer dad. It don't have nothing to do with me. But yet God used him to come back into my life as a young man to bring me to faith, because God had touched him, and then He touched me, and pointed me to the way. And I gave my life to Jesus Christ because of Him. And even though he wasn't the childhood dad that I needed and wanted, he was the adult dad that I really needed. And I think God kept him alive just to pray me through. And my dad was a praying man. I, it, you want to tell you the last prayer he did for me? Because I would always call him. I'd, I'd call him almost before every event. Say, Dad, pray for me, please. I'm about to go speak. He'd be like, oh, you betcha. And he'd pray. He, my dad was rough. I've had my nose, look, my nose has been broke plenty from martial arts. That's what I do. I'm an instructor. His stayed broke. <laughs> so he's like this, hey boy. <laughs> I tell people God saved him, but not his voice. And uh, so, you know that surgery I got on the thing, the appendix, right? Well, apparently I was moving around too much anyway. And other stuff I'm going to go into. But I tore a staple uh, post-surgery and I started bleeding so we had a towel on it as much compression as we could but the towel was soaked with blood and I had to go into the, the surgeon and I'm in there and and I'm in the, the room and I'm holding pressure because we tried we, it would not stop bleeding and I'm like Ugh. and I call my dad I'm in there by myself I say dad 
uh, dad pray for me they're going to come in here and I think they're going to suture me up I hope I didn't rip all the way through and you know my dad bless his heart he's old he was old dur ish and uh, he was old when he was young but you know he's just one of those guys old he had a hard life but he prays for me and he's also got narcolepsy you ever heard of that that's when you go to sleep right you're just like hey how's it and my dad, he would just doze off like that. And look, he go, he, I, dad, I said, Dad, pray for me. He goes, all right. So I'm holding this thing. And uh, he goes, Lord, this is the exact way. He said, Lord, I thank you for my boy. He said, oh. he goes, I, it sounds bad. What do you got going on bleeding and all that? He said, just help, help him. And I'm like. I didn't hear an amen or the, and he goes, and he comes back. Yeah. Lord, just, uh, <laughs> and this is how he lands the plane on an emergency prayer. He goes, I just hear my boy needs healing. Heal that. Lord, I pray the Holy Ghost will come upon him like bad breath and just <laughs> heal him in Jesus name. Amen. And I'm literally holding this. I'm laying on the bed in this room by myself. And I'm like, did he just say, Holy Ghost, bad breath, heal me? I'm thinking, boy, he, my dad is mixing his meds together right about now. I'm telling you, that's exactly what he said. That's crazy. All of a sudden, the nurse and doctor came in there like, okay, okay. All right. And he gets calls. He's ready. And I'm like, okay, you know, we've been trying to. I'm going to pull this off. You're going to have to apply pressure. I'm nervous. I'm like, don't let this thing, you know. He's like, okay, we got it. So I move it. He presses pressure, and he, he's got the gauze, and he starts soaking up blood, and, it's, and he, more gauze, and he starts wiping, and then he gets, he gets to where he just wipes it. There is no, there's no more blood. Nothing. Because it was a big emergency deal, especially my wife. My wife's going, What? Because she had to rush me over there, right? And make a big deal. And the doctor goes, uh, it's not bleeding. He goes like this. <laughs> he kept poking me. He goes, he looks at my wife. And my wife is mad. She's, she's like, I rushed you over here for this? And made a big scene? You're not even, you better bleed something. <laughs> and I, you know, I mean, I was all shocked. I was like, oh my gosh, my... I told my wife, my dad's prayer, Holy Ghost, bad breath, prayer, work. Oh, no. ah. <laughs> oh, he did put a couple of sutures in me just so my wife wouldn't be mad. He goes, I mean, I can put a couple of sutures in you just to, my wife's like, yeah, go ahead. Like, All right. That was hard. That was hard. Uh, losing dad and the stress that comes from all that. But here's the great news. Heaven became more real for me. And I know my dad being translated up into heaven. He's there now. He understands seeing the Lord face to face. And now he has been perfected. As we will. And we don't have to worry about being perfected on this earth. We just got to keep seeking him. And press toward the goal for the prize. And there is a prize. And it's the Lord. That's our prize. Believe me, I look forward to heaven. Heaven's not only a destination I look forward to. Hey, young people, heaven right now for me is a motivation. It's a motivation. Check your motivations. What motivates you for life? What are you living for? Girls, if you're just living for that guy, be careful. Because he will take your heart and... Ugh, right? If you're living for that job... What happens when they, you no more job? If you're living just for your physical ability or looks, what happens when you lose it? In martial arts, I, I remember my first big injury. I tore my hamstring out of my hip. And I was a kicker. That's what I did. I kicked people in the face. Hallelujah for the Lord. But my hamstring split off my hip and rolled up into a big ball. Hmm. I stayed awake for that surgery. And when they were reconnecting it, they gave me an epidural. They're like, why are you awake? I said, I just want to watch it. They put a mirror for me to try to see. 
Yeah, I'm not right. (laughs) There's suffering in this world. There is a fellowship of suffering because in your greatest time of need, you will see the Lord come and be there for you and love you in, in His presence. And when you sense His presence, it makes you realize, I, anything you want, Lord. And I know a lot of you may be thinking, well, my life's not fair. Things, Life isn't fair. I don't know any other way to say it. There is nothing fair about life. We live in a fallen world thanks to Eve. I'm sorry if your name's Eve. Why did your mom name you that? (laughs) Hi, little constant reminder of all of the failure of humanity. I joke, I joke. Because, you know, everybody's always throwing down on Eve, right? Uh, But, I mean, think about it. She didn't have a mom. She didn't have nobody, you know. She had a husband. He didn't have no dad. He didn't, you know. But he should have been at least a little more present in all this deal. How many of you, if you heard a doorbell at your house and your wife's at the door for a half hour and you just hear this talking, how many of you would just stay in your watching TV? Or you hear a dude talking to your wife? Wouldn't you like get up and come to the door? What's up? (laughs) He's a pool boy. Talking to your woman. You're all like, honey, uh, we don't even have a pull. What's... I was just thinking in case like we may get on in the future or something. No, Adam should have. When he heard that voice in the garden, he should have been right over there. Excuse me. Hey, what's up? <laughs> Mexican, he would have done it. What's up, Otto? Chew, we don't know you. <laughs> the Hispanic brother would have made a pair of boots and a purse right there. Ended our torture and humanity. My family's Spanish. Don't worry, I can pick on us. Thanks for joining us for today's episode. We'd love to stay connected with you and invite you to check out some of the work Victor is doing beyond this podcast around the world and ways to help fund the continued efforts of All Things Possible Ministries at victormarks.com. You can also catch us at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all linked in the show notes. Be sure to drop us a comment in the review section if today's episode has impacted you in any way or if there's anything you'd like to hear more of. We're always encouraged to hear from you. Thanks for spending your time with us. Until next time.